All right, Lori Sutton is a retired Brigadier General in the U.S. Army. She was the Army's highest ranking psychiatrist and also Commissioner of New York City's Department of Veteran Services, and she is also a candidate for the Mayor of New York. Hi, Lori. Hi, Dana. Good morning. Good morning. And you'll have to tell me, when is the election in New York for, for the mayor? Is that 2021? That's 2021. The Democratic primary is on June 23rd, with the general then following in November. But New York City politics being what they are, the primary is really the main event. All right. Tell me, why did you sign this letter saying vote for Biden? What's the idea of ex-military people uh, who normally do not endorse political candidates doing just that? You know, these are not ordinary times. And I actually, as a career military officer, I've been studiously nonpartisan, apolitical my entire life, always a registered independent. And I, uh, I feel very strongly in this moment, in this time, uh, we have to stand up. We have to stand up and we have to, uh, we have to uh, take stands that wake up Americans, that point to all of the erosions in our institutions, um, and all of the uh, provisions, the bulwarks of democracy, which I think are at risk here. And so for me to sign up on that letter, it was a very important statement. Uh, I wanted my name to be heard, that this is a time for ordinary people to stand up during this extraordinary time and um, let their views be known. It's extraordinary to me watching this from overseas in London, that so many Americans are talking about the threat to democracy. I mean, I've spent my life covering elections in places like Belarus and Russia and Afghanistan and civil wars. And the idea that you're actually talking about it in the American homeland, that your democracy is at threat, is astounding to me. Do you think that there's some melodramatic uh, you know, notion in there? Or do you actually fundamentally believe that you, the, the democratic process is on the rails. I fundamentally believe that everything that we have worked so hard to build, and not from a partisan perspective, but from a citizen's perspective, over the last 200 and almost 50 years, could come off the rails in this period of time where, after all, just uh, this week, we, um, we saw a debate that was like, no other, uh, in which a hate group, a domestic terrorist group, was told to stand by. Uh, we, we have seen time after time um, uh, elected officials, both in Congress as well as across the country, who, um, you know, have gone back on, on, on basic positions that they held, basic standards of decency. I mean, the whole issue right now seems to be mail-in ballots. I mean, uh, in addition to, you know, Trump uh, firing up militia groups and, and uh, people who he should be absolutely denouncing and distancing himself from, and I'll ask you that, but right now he seems to be laying the groundwork for saying that the mail-in ballots, which everybody is relying on, and you're a doctor, would know because of COVID-19, there are going to be a lot of them, and he is going to try to discount them on election night. I mean, that's, that's election chaos. Well, it's very clear. And I think that we will continue over these next four weeks, we will continue to see the seeds of that chaos and that effort to plant seeds of doubt in the minds of uh, Americans uh, as to whether or not their vote will count. And uh, if they do go to vote in person, whether or not they will um, encounter resistance or intimidation at the uh, poll station. General Chuck Boyd, a retired former Vietnam prisoner, is one of the people who signed that letter. He's always voted Republican. And I was watching his video where he talked about that if you don't vote against Trump now, you may not, quote, have a working democracy in 2024, unquote. These, these are the judgments of seasoned mm -hmm. leaders, as you said. These are not um, political ploys. They're not, uh, this is not an in action certainly that I or any of the people on that list took with any intention of scoring points or somehow 
gaining personal advantage or stirring up controversy. It's a time to stand up and be counted. And I think that's what you saw from that list is very serious people recognizing the gravity of this situation and deciding to take action. But you're less than 500. And I see some of the comments uh, after you, you and others of that list of almost 500 have posted their names. You know, a lot of people are saying you don't speak for the military and uh, you may be a very small percentage of of the military and you don't speak for us, some of them. There were a lot of people there that were applauding your signature as well. Sure, no, it were, uh, none of us signed that letter thinking that it was going to be a popularity contest, but it's an important discussion to have, an important debate to have. And if it can wake people up to pay attention to what's going on and to make their informed judgments, then it will have been an effort well spent. Trump in the debate told the Proud Boys, stand back, stand by. How do you interpret standby? Well, I think you need look no further than to see how the Proud Boys interpreted it. Immediately on social media, yes sir, Mr. President, standing by. I think the, the message is very clear. And it's not just this one message during this particular debate. There have been messages throughout the last three and a half years. And I think if you look at how Michael Cohen uh, has described the ways in which the president communicates and sends I'm messages. Lawyer, yeah. It's very, it's very clear that this is another one of those instances, which didn't just start this week, but actually throughout, in fact, before the election in 2016. How much influence did the reports in the Atlantic have on you that uh, suggested, you know, in, 19, in 2018 in France, that Trump wouldn't go to a memorial calling U.S. soldiers buried uh, they're losers. Well, I'm very disturbed by that report. I will say this, in a time like this, this moment in which we're living, where the emotions and the, the, uh, the divides are so sharp, I, I think that it would have been better for whoever that source was to either come forward and put that comment on the record or not make it because I think it's just, it hasn't solved anything. It's, it's just um, created more division and more dissent and more, frankly, from the president's perspective, uh, more uh, distrust in uh, the media. And so I think that was an unfortunate uh, decision, whoever that person was, that they didn't just come on the record and say uh, directly what it was that they heard purportedly from the president. I want to give you a bit of a right-hand turn because, and, and it's, it's a, an interesting question on my, on my part, but it's something that I've thought a lot about because I've done stories on QAnon and different things that are happening in America right now, and actually some of them are worldwide as well. But because you're in psychiatry, is there a medical explanation, do you think, for this adoption by so many Americans um, you know, almost a kind of paranoia, maybe because they've been locked down in COVID-19 that, um, you know, mainstream media is the, is the enemy. Uh, Democrats are, you know, pedophiles, keeping people locked in their basements. Um, the election is being stolen. Uh, we have to stand up. And that, that motivates some of these militia groups as well. I mean, some pretty crazy stuff out there, but with some very big foundations and followings. Yes, and I think um, if you go back, I, I look at the president as a problem, but he's not the problem. I think that the problems that we see now that are really coming to fruition have really been those that have been um, growing over a period of years. I think, uh, you know, we have on the right, we have a whole segment of the country who over the last 20 years or so have seen their identities sort of be lost. The manufacturing jobs have gone to globalization. Uh, they feel disparaged by the elites on both sides of the aisle. Both parties, I think, have been uh, guilty of this. And they feel like the America that they grew up in, they, don't, they no longer recognize it. And there's an identity um, issue here that is very, very deep, the vein of resentment uh, and anger and rage that the president has been masterful in tapping into. I think on the left, you see an entire uh, generation. Um, let's take AOC as an example and the generations that she represents. 
their entire living memory of growing up, our country has been at war. They've seen the failures of the financial system in 2008 and 2009. There's been nothing about uh, the, the free market capitalist system that we fought so hard for years ago uh, as allies. There's been no, no uh, living memory for them that capitalism as the most powerful engine for creating wealth that the world has ever known. They have not seen that in operation in a way that would convey um, confidence or trust. And so I think that leaves us with these two extremes. Um, and you're seeing now with the fear that has been generated, and you know, understandably so, with the COVID virus. And so people are being very reactive as opposed to you know, being in, in what we call our resilient zone where you can respond, where you can think and you can reason. Instead, what you're seeing, both with the advent of cyber um, bullying and social media and all of those sorts of things, we're living in a, a world that is bathed, marinated, if you will, in fear and toxic, um, uh, toxic rhetoric that demonizes the other. That demonize and, dis and disinformation on such a wide scale that I mean, look, I'm a media person, and I think I can generally navigate somewhere close to truth, but it it becomes more and more challenging for me as well. And I think for a lot of people, a lot of Americans who are you know tapping into that social media, and all of them generally are because they're locked in their homes during the, a pandemic, and it gets very murky, and there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, and it's hard for them to understand what is truth and what is not. Well, and if you look at the history of, you know, fascist movements, authoritarian regimes, revolutions from uh, past history, you see a very common pattern where um, fear uh, takes root in a society and that a strong man authoritarian leader will then systematically erode trust in the institutions, in the free press, in uh, the judiciary, and you see all of that. And, and, and of course, it's been supercharged by now technology and the ability to connect in real time. But I think if you look at, for example, um, uh, Putin in Russia has provided an absolute playbook on how to systematically and in a very compressed period of time, peel back the institution of, of democracy and lay bare uh, a very um, uh, disturbing very disturbing reality. Well, the KGB is very good at that. And I, I don't think they ever had a really good uh, planted democracy. And they kind of looked to the American model. And now a lot of countries that have looked towards American democracy as the model are beginning to question all of that. But, but coming back to history and those leaders who have taken advantage of that confusion and disinformation. And I mean, you're pretty well saying that President Trump is doing that, it, that he is laying those seeds and he is also trying to reap the rewards of that. I think that's very clear. And that's why this letter of yours sends a message out to people saying what, as, as people who, who have been leaders, you're, you're saying what to Americans? Wake up, take a look, get informed, decide for yourself. I'm not telling you what to think, but I am saying that from my perspective and my experience, I'm very, very concerned. And I see this as being a real, um, it sounds cliche, but it's it's a uh, it's a crucible uh, um, crossroads for us as a country, and and part of the reason, Dana, that I'm I'm running for mayor is that as I have seen uh, these factors and these conditions and these these dynamics take root over the last several years, uh, particularly dating back to uh, you know 2018, where we you know the political system in our country, our city at least, with AOC's victory just really tore the existing uh, status quo apart. And I watched as career politicians, you know, ran for the far left trying to curry favor with the DSA, the Democratic Socialist. Uh, I saw uh, the rhetoric take on a very charged, cruel, mean, um, uh, and demeaning tone of, of demonizing entire industries of of demeaning wealth and the wealthy and um, <laughs> I I 
I kept asking myself as I saw conditions in on the street with increased violence and the seriously mentally ill and all of these factors coming together. And this was even before the pandemic. I said, where's the leadership going to come from that can unify our city and lift us up and, and move us forward? And I didn't see it. And my, my, um, my bedrock conviction, Dana, is that as our city, as New York City goes, so goes much of our country. And as our country goes, so much, so goes much of our world. And so I, 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 I feel a, a distinct call to duty, call to action to apply every bit of the leadership and the experience that I've gained over the decades since I first started out uh, as a second lieutenant in the Army. And I'm bringing that to bear and uh, giving New Yorkers a choice. Well, I know uh, Brigadier Generals and former Brigadier Generals can move mountains. I've been around them in Afghanistan and Iraq, so I, I, uh, I don't underestimate you in any way. But I would just final question to you, and that would be, is there a way, is there a path back to a more civil America after this? After this election, whether Trump wins or Biden wins and both sides cry foul uh, and it may be fought in the courts for weeks and potentially months, uh, and it could be fought in the street even and at polling stations. What, what is the road back to, to kind of, you know, a more healthy America and democracy? I think there is a road back. Uh, if the president is reelected, I think the message is very clear that the nation will have spoken uh, in favor of law and order, of bringing back safety and security to our streets, to our neighborhoods, to our schools, to our workplaces. And as mayor of New York City, if I were given the privilege to serve in that capacity, I would work very closely with the administration and with all levels of government and all uh, domains of, of, of society here in the city. And New York, being the global crossroads of the world, would work with our, our, um, our UN uh, partners as well as the amazing strength that we have here in New York City, where we have immigrants and families and working business owners from all over the world. And I think it's that process of engagement that's going to be very, very critical. If uh, Vice President Biden wins, then we'll be in for another set of challenges. But I will work to bring people together to find the areas where we can agree on, and that's great. But then to acknowledge those points of disagreement and to look for ways to build bridges across the areas of disagreement. We have to be able to come together with respect. I guess that's what I would, um, as much as anything, want to bring back to the public domain and to the marketplace of ideas and to this um, incredible city that right now is, is really, really struggling um, uh, in search of a champion, in search of a leader who will put the city first. You put the city first, do what's best for the city, and all of us living within the city will benefit. And so I think it's that kind of inclusive approach that um, is looking to uh, tell the truth. It's not about what people want to hear. It's about being a leader who has the courage and the moral fiber to say what needs to be said and to set out a vision and to know that it's going to take all of us working together, all of us. And that's what my life of leadership has been as a career public servant and as someone who has led in combat, someone who has led during times of extreme life and death circumstances. This is a time, Dana, where our career politicians, many of them just simply lack the capacity to lead in times of life and death crisis. They've never, they've never had to do that before. The best of them do have a set of core values which they apply to their personal lives and apply to their professional decisions in public life. Uh, but for those who lack that core set of values and convictions, if they, you know, if your lens in leadership has always been the lens of politics, you are woefully unprepared and inept and incapable to lead under these circumstances. Laurie Sutton, great to talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dana.